Coming in at number 5 we have Capuchin Monastery Catacombs, Palermo, Italy. This location is not for the squeamish. The Capuchin Monastery Catacombs is home to thousands of well dressed corpses, one of the world's most bizarre and morbid tourist attractions. After walking through the monastery you descend into the catacombs where you have the chance to share small enclosed space with thousands of corpses that have been well preserved. Some hanging from the walls, some laying down and others sat on benches. They believe that having the dead on display like this shows respect to them. Here nothing stands between the living and the dead, other than a sign asking people to be respectful. The ill lit musty catacombs have been separated into a few corridors, each one hosting a specific type of person. There is a room for religious figures, mainly those affiliated with the monastery, for professionals such as doctors and a room for women. There is a corpse of a person that's said to be so well preserved that she simply looks like she is sleeping. She has been given the name. Sleeping Beauty. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty terrifying. It is believed that the particularly dry atmosphere allowed for the natural mummification of the bodies. Initially, priests would lay the dead on shelves and allow them to drip until they were completely depleted of bodily fluids. A full year later, the dried out corpse would be rinsed with vinegar before being redressed in their best attire and sent to their proper room to stand for eternity. Who knows how many of their spirits still roam the catacombs with no way out? It's not a question I want to find the answer to. In at number 4 we have Black Swan Hotel in York, England. The city of York was built back in 71 AD and was founded between 8000 and 7000 BC. First inhabited by Romans, then Vikings, it has a long history making it the perfect place for ghosts and spirits to roam. Some have even claimed that it is the most haunted city in the world. Just one of the many haunted locations in York is the Black Swan Pub. It was built for William Bowes, a merchant and Sheriff of York in 1417, who also became Lord Mayor in 1428. There are few unusual features and stories surrounding the pub. There is a passageway that was built under the building. It is unclear why this was built, but there have been rumours it once led to the church. It has since been sealed off, but you can still see the stairs leading down under the building and a hallway leading off into the distance. The pub was used as a horse refuge during World War II, and there are even stories of men coming to the pub to all Auction off their wives during 1884. Through the history of the building, there have been a few spirits who have decided to stick around. One of the regulars is a workman in a bowler hat who regularly fidgets and tuts, as if he is waiting for someone to arrive. He is often seen walking from room to room or waiting at the bar before fading away. No one knows who this spirit is, but it is believed he has been here since 1850 when bowler hats were introduced. Some say he resembles Charlie Chaplin, but he is not the only spirit who inhabits the Pub, also frequently seen as a young woman in a long white dress. She stands at the bar in the back room gazing into the fireplace. You can see the grief in the woman's face, she appears to be dealing with some kind of loss. This is just one of the many haunted buildings around York, so travel here at your own risk. In at number 3 we have Bell Witch Farm in Tennessee. In the early 1800s, John Bell bought a tract of farmland along Tennessee's Red River. Bell and his family thrived on the farm until they started to see strange looking animals around the property, most notably a dog with a rabbit's head. From that point on, the family was beset upon by unseen forces, largely targeted at Bell and his daughter Betsy. They experienced physical attacks, heard unexplained noises, and even spoke with the entity. What was the Bell Witch? Like most supernatural stories, certain details vary from version to version. But the prevailing account is that the Bell Witch claimed to be the spirit of Kate Batts, a mean old neighbour of John Bell who believed she was cheated by him in a land purchase. On her deathbed, she swore that she would haunt John Bell and his descendants. The human interactions with the spirits date all the way back to 1817. Former President Andrew Jackson was quoted as saying, I had rather face the entire British army than to spend another night with the Bell Witch, after he and some of his troops spent a night at the Bell's farm. Over time, so many people travel great distances to visit the Bell's home that it had to eventually be torn down for safety purposes in the latter part of the 1800s. The historic Bell Witch Cave has preserved some of the artifacts from the original cabin such as a chimney stone and an iron kettle. You can see these articles along with some other artifacts, news articles and photos from the time John Bell and his family resided on the farm when touring the reconstructed Bell Cabin. If you're interested in paranormal activity or if you're a history buff then the Bell Witch Cave and farm will definitely not disappoint. In at number 2 we have Velisca Axe Murder 
murder house in Villisca. The small Iowa town of Villisca doesn't have much to offer tourists except for a night of terror at the Villisca Axe murder house. Back in 1912, the white wood framed house was the site of a horrifying crime that left an entire family dead by axe. Shortly after midnight on June 10, 1912, a stranger hefting an axe lifted the latch on the back door of a two story timber house in the little Iowa town of Villisca. The door was not locked. Crime was not something you worried about in a modestly prosperous Midwest settlement of no more than 2,000 people. The visitor was able to slip inside silently and close the door behind him. Still carrying the axe, the stranger walked past one room in which two girls lay sleeping and slipped up the narrow wooden stairs that led to two other bedrooms. He ignored one in which four more children were sleeping. He crept into the room in which 43 year old Joe Moore lay next to his wife Sarah, raising the axe high above his head so high it gouged the ceiling. The man brought the flat of the blade down onto Joe. Then he struck Sarah before she had time to wake or register his presence. Leaving the couple, the killer went next door and used the axe on the other residents in the room. Once again, there was no evidence that they woke before they died. Nor did the assailant or any of the other people in the home make sufficient noise to disturb Catherine's two friends, Lena and Enos Dillinger, as they slept downstairs. The killer then descended the stairs and took the lives of the Dillinger girls. What happened next marked the Velisca killings as truly peculiar and still sends shivers down the spine a century after the fact. The axeman went back upstairs and behaved headed everyone in the home, leaving the faces of all six members of the family unrecognizable. The moors were not discovered until several hours later. When neighbors didn't see the family wake in the morning, they called for Velisca's marshal, Hank Horton. That sit and train a sequence of events that destroyed what little hope there may have been of gathering useful evidence from the crime scene. When a shaken doctor emerged, he cautioned members of the growing crowd outside, don't go in there boys, you'll regret it until the last day of your life. Many ignored the advice, as many as 100 curious neighbors and townspeople tramped as they blew through the the house scattering fingerprints. It is probably due to this damage to the crime scene along with the lack of knowledge on such large crimes that the killer was never found. It could have been one of the noisy neighbours or someone passing through time, but no one will ever know. What we do know is that there have been sightings of the family spirit since and the house continues to be a main attraction for dark tourism. And finally in a number one we have House of Danger in New York. New York's Greenwich Village has some of the most desirable real estate in the world, except for this house on West 10th Street, known as the House of Danger. The townhouse is said to be haunted by the ghosts of 22 people who lived or died within its walls, including the tragic story of a girl who was killed by her adopted father. Being New York City, however, the house has a celebrity pedigree too. Said that author Mark Twain stayed in the house back in 1900 and returned for the occasional visit. The house seems to have started earning its reputation gradually after the Borman family stopped living there. The first recorded incident of bad luck happened in 1897. Cycling celebrity Fred Andrew, the new owner and occupant of 14 West 10th Street, had a moment of bad luck. During his residency, as described in the New York Times, of August 9, 1897, Andrew had a moment of reckless bicycle riding that caused him to hit a person. The person suffered a broken leg and Andrew was subsequently arrested. Jan Bryant Bartle and her daughter took up residency of a spacious apartment on the top floor in 1957. Bartle reported almost immediately that a monstrous moving shadow would often follow her around the home. One time she writes that she had seen a ghostly figure of a man standing in a hall. Bravely she reached out and tried to touch whatever she was seeing. She felt something but nothing like she had felt before. She described it as a substance without substance, chilly and damp. Bartle was a true believer and took the proactive step of employing a paranormal expert to investigate what could be causing these terrifying realities for the scared residents. The investigator confirmed what the couple had believed from the start. The investigator said that they were upward of 22 spirits at the house of danger. Besides Mark Twain, he mentioned additionally a woman in a white dress, a young girl, and a grey cat. On November 2nd, 1987, New York City witnessed a genuine tragedy at the house of danger. The passing of Lisa Nusbaum was so horrific it caught everyone's attention. Around 6:40 a.m., 911 operators got a pressing phone call from children's author and editor Hedda Nusbaum. She said that her daughter Lisa wasn't breathing, so an ambulance was sent to Greenwich residence right away. When the paramedics arrived, they were greeted by a very disturbing scene. They found Lisa unresponsive on the kitchen floor and her brother Mitchell tied up in the home. Paramedics were regrettably unable to revive Lisa on their way to the hospital. Later, her autopsy revealed the cause of death was repeated blunt force trauma. Hedda and Joel were both arrested and subsequently charged with first degree murder. Currently in private ownership, the building is resided in today and continues to add stories of hauntings to the legends of paranormal activity in the house of death. The stairwell continues to be the nexus of the ghostly activity in the building. The dark and wide antique stairs are where many of the ghosts still make their appearance. Number 5 on this list is Abbaye de Mortemer. This abbey is located in the French town of Mortemer in the Normandy region and has a deep history to it. In the mid 1500s this was a prosperous area filled with a bunch of monks. It was a growing town that was one of the most successful in the region. 
This didn't last too long though. When the 1700s struck, things changed quickly. The men who were funding this town grew greedy and cared little for the people that were living there. The abbey itself started to deteriorate and the monks began moving out. Soon it was a shell of its former self and only had four monks that it housed. This wasn't the end though because in 1789 this abbey saw the worst horror of its history. The French Revolution was at its height and sweeping its way through France. Religion was completely out of favor and that meant the four monks that were living there were also out of favor. When the revolutionaries got to this location and found these monks, they didn't hold back. They took them into the cellar of this abbey and brutally massacred all four of them with no provocation. People think that this was one of the main incidents that caused this place to become one with the spirits. Since then, many ghostly sightings have been reported at this spot. One of the most famous stories was in World War II. A British paratrooper landed in the forest nearby and was spotted by the Germans. He thought he was doomed for until a monk appeared out of nowhere and guided him to safety. It's believed that this is one of the spirits of the dead monks still trying to help those in desperate need. One of the most famous ghostly legends is the woman in white who wanders the grounds. This ethereal being floats through the area and was even photographed once before. Her origin is currently unknown, but it seems that after the monks were killed, this area became home to not only their spirits, but many. Werewolves, goblin cats, and other demonic things have also been spotted here. This place is deeply haunted, and even though that one paratrooper was saved by a ghost, I think that's the exception rather than the rule, and for that reason, I still wouldn't recommend going here. Number four on this list is the Chateau de Brissac. This chateau in France is located in the Loire River Valley south of the village of Angers in France. It's a very beautiful chateau and extremely unique because it's actually a mix of two different chateaus. In the early 11th century, an initial castle was built on the land, but then several hundred years later in the 15th century, the land was taken over by the Duke of Brissac who had his own vision for the space. He tore down most of the castle except for the twin medieval towers and then built around those so you get this very interesting style of chateau. This chateau is also apparently the tallest in all of France. The great beauty of this castle and unique architecture aren't the only things that distinguish it though because it's also one of the most haunted. An expert on the castle named Wesley McDermott gives great insight into the entity haunting this building where he says, A double murder that occurred sometime in the 15th century within the walls of the castle has resulted in one of the more popular ghosts of the Chateau de Brissac, that of the La Dame there, or Green Lady. The current residents, the Duke of Brissac and his family have become accustomed to her roaming the rooms, but she has scared many a guest. She's often seen in the tower room of the chapelle wearing her green dress. What's most terrifying, however, is her face. If she looks at you, you'll see that her face has gaping holes where her eyes and her nose should be, resembling a corpse. As well as her sighting, her moans are often heard throughout the castle in the early hours. After researching this, I found that Wesley was correct and there is no end to the stories and encounters people have had with this green lady. I honestly do recommend going to this castle to look at its beautiful exterior. Going inside though, is something that I wouldn't do. In at number three, we have the Alaskan Hotel in Alaska. Built in 1913 during the gold rush, the Alaskan Hotel is the oldest hotel in the area. The hotel was built to be a luxury experience for those passing by as they advertised as a pocket version of the finest hostelry on the west coast. The high fashion and glitz were a paltry concealment for the legal process and sale of illicit substances that went on there throughout its history. The hotel overcame many issues that it faced since opening, one being the 1980 imposition of bone dry prohibition. They turned their bar into a cafe serving soda while also running a speakeasy like most of the previous bars at the time. The Alaskan hotel was a brothel twice in her history, first legally and second not legal in 1977 which was shut down by the fire marshal. There is one main soul who inhabits the Alaskan hotel today that is a gold miner's wife. She lived at the hotel while waiting for him to return. When he did not return, she began to support herself through prostitution. But then he did return. When he returned to his wife, he was furious with what she had been doing and then murdered her in the hotel. There have since been a number of sightings of her at the hotel. She is said to be very angry and restless. When she is around, the air goes cold and some have reported hearing footsteps wandering the halls. Some even hear crying coming from the walls, but it is unclear where the noise is coming from. There is also a number of abandoned mines located near the town, so if you're looking for ghosts, this is the place to be. 
Coming in at number 2 we have City of the Dead, North Ossetia, Russia. Not many people have been to the City of the Dead, it is a dangerous and long journey to reach the village. There are also myths and legends warning that those who do reach the city never return. Reaching this mystifying destination requires a 3 hour drive, taking you down a dangerous and hidden road. It is located in North Ossetia in Russia. If you do manage to reach the city you will come across many white huts that look like houses, however they are not. These are actually stone crypts. It is said that in the 18th century a plague hit the city leaving no one behind. The clans built quarantine houses for the sick, they would bring the food but not the freedom to move about until death claimed their lives. The even sadder side is that people who did not have family to build the hut or bring them food simply went to the large graveyard and simply waited for death. It was a very slow and painful way to go. For those who dare to visit the city a little well was created outside of each home. If you drop a coin in the well and you hear it hit the stone at the bottom then the person who died here went to heaven. If you do not hear a noise then this indicates that the spirit did not pass on and may still be in the village. My advice would be don't visit this city, we don't need an 18th century disease. And lastly in at number 1 we have Crater Rock Castle in Victoria, British Columbia. What first appears to be a beautiful castle is actually a haunted home with a tragic past. The Craig de Rock Castle was built in the 1800s as a home for a wealthy family, coal industrialist Robert Dunsmere and his wife Joan. It was built over 2,300 meters and comprises 39 rooms. However, Robert died 17 months before the construction was completed. The original architect of the castle, Warren Haywood Williams, also unfortunately died before the finalization of the home. His son James and Alexander decided to finish the castle after their father's death. Robert's death caused a lot of trouble within the family. His sons James and Alex were disappointed that their father's business and assets had been left to their mother. They claimed that they had an oral agreement from their father that they would receive the family business. For the following years they tried countlessly to get the family business from their mother and after 7 years they finally received the title to the San Francisco company. Feeling financially stable Alex finally married his partner of 20 years Josephine, however their marriage only lasted 6 weeks as he died on their honeymoon in New York. When he died the family was torn apart once more over his will. Joan and James fought for years going to the highest court level. They did not speak during the legal battle and then finally Joan passed away in 1908 in Craig Doric Castle in Victoria where she lived for 18 years. It was believed that James wouldn't attend her funeral, however he did at last. The house has now been taken over by the Craig Doric Castle Historical Museum Society. There have been many ghost stories presumed to be connected to the Dunsmere family. One of the main spectres is a woman who walks down the main staircase case in a ball gown. No one has seen her in any other part of the castle and she never goes up the stairs. Could it be the ghost of Joan going to greet her husband? In the basement of the home there have been sightings of a little girl crying, although they disappear if she hears anyone approaching. There have been multiple sightings of her. She is believed to be the youngest daughter of Robert who died just months after he did. As well as these sightings there have also been other weird goings on around the castle. Often people hear the crying of a child from various parts of the castle. Objects would also move on their own when no one was around. Around. Some can also hear a piano being played in the dining room when no one is present, but there is no piano in the castle. It seems there are many ghosts of the Dunsmere family within the castle walls who don't want to leave their home. In at number 5 we have Loftus Hall. This place may be the most haunted house in all of Ireland, and it is said to be haunted by the devil himself. Lotus Hall is a large country house located on the Hook Peninsula in County Wexford. In 1170, Raymond Le Gros came to the county and built this massive castle, which was known as the Houseland Castle. The Redmond family replaced the original castle with another in about 1350. This second castle was known as the Hall, or Redmond Hall. Later in 1872, John Henry Wellington Graham Loftus undertook took an extensive rebuilding of the entire mansion, adding many of the famous elements like the grand staircase, mosaic tiled floor, elaborate parquet flooring and technical elements that hadn't been seen in houses in Ireland at the time, such as flushing toilets and blown air heating. Charles Tottenham became the lord of the manor in 1752 by marrying the honourable Anne Loftus, the daughter of the first Viscount Loftus, and they had six children. However, his wife became ill and died while the girls were still young. Two years later, Tottenham married his cousin Jane. Cliff, and they lived together, along with one of Charles's daughters in Loftus Hall. One evening, Charles was resting in his home in 1775 with his second wife and daughter from his first marriage, Anne, while the Loftus family were away on business. During a storm, a ship unexpectedly arrived at the Hook Peninsula, where the mansion was located. A young man was welcomed into the mansion. Anne and the young man became very close. One night, the family and the mysterious man were in the games room playing cards, and it was then when Anne noticed the man having a cloven foot. The man went 
went up through the roof, ultimately leading to his demise and leaving behind a large hole in the ceiling which remains today. Soon Anne became mentally ill. It's believed that the family were ashamed of Anne and locked her away in her favourite room which was known as the tapestry room. She refused food and drink and sat with her knees under her chin looking out the tapestry room window, waiting for her mysterious stranger to return until she passed away in the tapestry room in 1775. It is said that when she died they could not straighten her body as her muscles had seized and she was buried in the same sitting position in which she had died. After her death everyone who had lived there says she still haunts the hall to this day. After being purchased by Aidan Quigley in 2011 this building was marketed as a haunted house that hosted guided tours of the house until 2020 when it was put on the market for sale. In at number 4 we have the Abbey of the Black Hag. The old abbey lies on a small valley about 2 miles east of the village of Shannon Golden in the townland of the Old Abbey. In one of the earliest nunneries in Ireland, it is first mentioned in 1298 and was founded on land donated by John Fitz Thomas of Canelo, who had died in 1261. Remains include the abbey church with two small spaces adjacent, and one appears to have been a sacristy and a vaulted building to the west. There are also walls and a gate and traces of an orchard, a fish pond and a pigeon house. Modifications to the church in the 15th century saw the inclusion of an east window in the church as well as a doorway in the north. Traces of window decoration, columns and carved tombstones remain. Barrels were also located and the church plate was reportedly found in the late 18th century. It is said that the last abbess terrified the local population with her use of the black arts and sexual practices in a room to the south of the church and is now called the Black Hag Cell. After the closure of the abbey the hag remained there and continued to perform her unholy acts and it's believed she lived unusually long which caused her ancient skin to become darker and darker over time. Another legend is regarding the Earl of Desmond and that during his escape from one of the many battles between the Geraldines and the Butlers, the Countess was wounded by an arrow. The wound was so serious that the Earl believed the Countess had died and buried her beneath the altar in the main chapel. The Countess awoke to find herself buried alive and when people would see a ghostly figure they went to her gravesite and they had found her finger bones had been worn out from clawing at the coffin and it's believed her screams can still be heard to this day. Number 3 on this list is Grey Le Bains. This is a commune that is in the southeastern part of France. The reason why this town is so haunted is because of all the conflicts that have taken place there over the years. If you name any significant war that has happened within France, it's most likely that at some point or another, a battle was fought at this place. This has caused a lot of untimely death of soldiers and also the civilians who were living there. All of this death has left some spirits behind and made it so that this town is deeply haunted. Even though this is a town, the area that is most haunted seems to be located close to the castle at the top of this town. The reason that I say at the top is because this is a mountaintop village and the way that this town is laid out has the castle right at the zenith. Therefore everything is cascading down from this haunted castle that towers over the rest of the residents. There isn't one ghost who lays a rule to this town but a collection of ghostly spirits. It's said that if you walk around the castle at night time then many voices will start to speak out of thin air. Shadows will dance on the walls as if someone is around you but once again there'll be nothing. People also report having a a deep sense of uneasiness when they're in this area and feel unwanted. The ghosts here don't sound as dangerous as some of the other ones, but I still don't recommend checking this place out. Number two on this list is Chateau de Blende la Tour. This is a castle that is located directly in the village of Blende la Tour. This castle certainly isn't the most ornate in nature. It looks to prioritize functionality over beauty. This was largely because its main use was during the 100 years war and the French wanted to make sure it wouldn't get captured by the British. This castle is very unique with its haunting. It's always haunted by one specific ghost which I'm going to get into, but on one particular day of the year this place goes off the rails with paranormal activity and it's this event that has given the castle the title as the most haunted castle in all of France. At midnight on All Saints Day, which is on November the 1st, it's said that a plethora of phantoms will fly out and circle around the tower of this castle. They will scream and wail and cause a major ruckus. People have also said that these wailings feel inherently sinister in nature, almost as if these ghosts are driving people away from this place. Reports have also said that chains can be heard smashing against the walls and screams from below in the tower are heard as if people are locked up there. This event only takes place on November 1st at midnight though and is now part of the lore and culture around this village. On a regular day, this castle isn't completely without ghostly apparitions though. The ghost of the master of the castle from the 11th century century walks throughout in a bloodied outfit. 
It's said that he was murdered with a dagger and that his spirit walks around to this day still holding that same dagger which killed him. Number one on this list is Chateau de Bonaguil. This castle is located in saint francois sur la masse and was built in the medieval ages. It's decently well kept considering how old it is today. As with most castles that were built around that time, this one played a critical role in the 100 years war. It's said that it was fought over multiple times and retaken by both sides multiple times as well. Aside from its deep history, reports of a potential haunting have run rampant all throughout France. In fact, people were so convinced that a spiritual presence was living here that a team went to go investigate it. This group of paranormal experts went in and made some startling discoveries. They said that when they got there, the thing that they noticed and detected the most was the sensation of somebody touching their shoulder, as if somebody was right behind you and had their hand just on one of your shoulders. This went hand in hand with a sensation of burning. Apparently the burning didn't have them in pure agony, but they were all reportedly uncomfortable for sure. The temperature changes didn't stop there either because it also got incredibly cold all of a sudden. Creepy noises, loud shouts, and a very guttural and deep moan that echoed throughout the castle were all things that this group had reported as well. Nobody knows who or what ghostly spirit is causing these occurrences, but it's clear that something isn't quite right about this French chateau. Number five, Leap Castle. For 700 years, Leap Castle has proudly stood in Ireland, boasting a rather infamous reputation as the most haunted castle in the world, which I feel is a title it must have really fought hard for. I mean, Dracula had a castle, that's gotta be the most haunted castle. The castle was first built in the 13th century, home to the O'Bannon clan, but it would be adopted by the ruling O'Carroll clan, who seized control of it completely by the 15th century. From here, ownership would pass from father to son, but was punctuated by blood. Rival clans, wars, and even family member assassinations were all par for the course of Leap Castle's bloodied history. A grim oubliette where prisoners would be pushed from a window, landing into a pit of spikes, really completed the castle. After centuries of battles and brawls over the castle, it would eventually be burned in 1922 during the Irish Civil War where it was then abandoned. Now it goes without saying that a castle that saw as much bloodshed as this is home to a bevy of trapped spirits. The most present one is the bloody chapel spirit. Legend has it that one of the O'Carroll children had his own brother assassinated to gain power. His brother, a member of the clergy, is said to restlessly wander the burnt out chapel. Visitors report seeing beams of light, the smell of burnt rubber, and the shadow of a priest in the stairwell. There's reports of a spirit of a young girl named Emily who fell from the rampart in the 16th century and tragically lost her life. There's stories of people seeing the ghost of a young girl walking atop the battlements, dragging a misshapen leg as she walks. Today, you can try to visit the Leap Castle if you're feeling daring enough to contact the owner, Sean Bryan, who does offer private tours. It'll be you, him, and all the spirits the castle has to offer. And hey, if you're looking for a vacation to a haunted spot, but you don't want to leave your room, why not subscribe to Top 5 Scary? We got more haunted sites than you could visit in a lifetime, and we're just a click away. Moving on. Number four, separate prison. Eh, going to prison probably sucks. I've never been, but I have heard bad things. A regular prison is pretty bad enough without the wardens getting too creative with their punishments. And then there's prisons like Australia's infamous separate prisons, where it seems like they were trying to set a world record for cruelty. Built in 1833, it was going to serve as a home for some of England's toughest crooks who had to be shipped all the way down under. A home for the toughest criminals needed to be pretty tough, right? Well, unfortunately, it was. Just in the psychological sense, not physical. Separate prison was inspired by the philosophical concept of the panopticon, a template for a prison where all prisoners would be seen under one watchtower. Inmates were to only ever be referred to by the numbers sewn on their uniforms and were to wear black hoods at all times they were in their cells to help them better reflect on their crimes. I'm sure that went over swimmingly with a bunch of violent criminals. Well, it didn't. It mostly led to inmates going mad or offing each other in the hopes that capital punishment was preferable to being imprisoned there, which is a sign that your system is working. Look, it probably goes without saying that this is a haunted prison now, right? I mean, there's over a thousand bodies buried in unmarked graves on an island that held a prison where everyone had to wear dark hoods. There's no way it's not haunted. Well, it's on this list, so it is. The prison is now owned by Australia's Parks and Wildlife Services, who offer ghost tours of the grounds, where visitors report all sorts of hauntings. Screams, wailings can be heard wandering through the halls, rocking chairs moving by themselves during the night. There's an option on the prison's website to take a tour with just a lantern to guide you. 
if you're feeling particularly brave. In at number three, we have Cork District Lunatic Asylum. The Cork District Lunatic Asylum opened in 1789, and by 1845, the Irish Lunatics Asylum Act allowed for appropriating the lunatic asylum in the city of Cork to the purposes of a district lunatic asylum. The legislation provided for two new asylums a criminal one in Dundrum, Dublin, and then a 500 bed asylum in Cork. This building was originally in three separate blocks, later to be joined together in the interest of providing more accommodation. To become the longest facade of any building in the country, it opened in 1852. William Saunders Halloran was an Irish psychiatrist who worked at this asylum from the time it opened until his death and was the author of Practical Observations on the Causes and Cure of Insanity. This doctor's methods were extreme and torturous. He created something called the Halloran's Chair, which rotated hysterical patients up to 100 revolutions per minute. It rarely had the desired effect. Inmates lived out their days in a state of paranoia and despair while admitted at the asylum. The horrors of this place finally ended when the asylum was closed in 1992. It stayed abandoned for many years and locals and tourists went to visit this scary place. They claim the tortured souls still remain here and paranormal investigators even visited and claimed to have seen both and heard voices of these tormented souls. Today the building is being converted and renovated into apartments called At Hall. In at number two, we have the Hellfire Club. The Hellfire Club is located on Mount Pellier Hill in Dublin. The building gets its name because it's believed to be one of the first Freemason lodges in Ireland. Around 1725, William Connolly, who was one of the wealthiest men in Ireland at the time, built this building to be a hunting lodge. Years after the build, the roof was blown off during a storm, and locals believed it was the work of an aggressive spirit seeking vengeance on Connolly for building on their land. And that's when the story started swirling. After Connolly's death, the the building was quickly sold and is said to have become a meeting place for the Irish Hellfire Club. The club was founded in 1735 by Richard Parsons, a known dabbler in black magic. The members met at locations across Dublin and were known for their immoral behaviour and debauchery involving alcohol and sex. The secrecy surrounding the club members led to speculation that they were satanists and devil worshippers. The president of the club was named the King of Hell and dressed like Satan with horns, wings and hooves. The members were said to set a place at each meeting for the devil in the hopes that he would attend. They were also said to hold black masses in the lodge during which cats and even servants were sacrificed. Some say the building was deliberately set on fire in order to enhance its hellish atmosphere. The best known Hellfire Club story is the one in which the devil himself appears. A stranger had joined the members at a game of cards. At some point one of the card players dropped a card on the floor. As he bent down to retrieve it, he noticed that the stranger had cloven hoops instead of feet. Another tale concerns a young farmer, curious to find out what went on in the meetings. Climbing up Mount Pellier Hill one night, he was invited by members of the club and allowed to witness the night's activities. He was found the next morning trembling and terrified. Tradition says he spent the rest of his life unable to speak, unable even to remember his name. The Hellfire Club remains burnt out and abandoned on Mount Pellier Hill looking over Dublin. It is a beautiful sight on a sunny day, but make sure you leave before night. It's a beautiful sight on a sunny day, but make sure you leave before night comes because you may come into contact with the unusual smells, ghostly apparitions or paranormal sightings, and it's said that satanic rituals are known to be done here. And finally in at number one we have Leap Castle. Of the many haunted places in Ireland, Leap Castle is possibly the most notorious of all, and is one of the most well known symbols of haunted Ireland. This place is located in Calderry in County Offaly. There are many accounts of when the main tower was constructed, but could go back as far as 1250 CE and was built by the O'Bannon clan. The O'Bannons were the secondary chieftains of the territory and were subject to the ruling O'Carroll's clan. There are many stories of who or what haunts this place. A red lady goes is reported to walk the halls holding a dagger, and also two little girls named Charlotte and Emily are reported to run up and down the spiral staircase in the mansion. A red lady ghost is reported to walk the halls holding a dagger, and also two girls named Charlotte and Emily are reported to run up and down the spiral staircase in the mansion. Emily passed away after she fell from the top of the castle's tower, and Charlotte can still be seen running around after her sister and calling her name. The castle was visited by paranormal investigators from shows like Most Haunted and Scariest Places on Earth. These investigators believe the castle is haunted by a sinister elemental spirit. The creature is described as being about the size of a sheep with a human face, black holes for eyes and nose, and giving off the smell of a rotting corpse. During renovation of the castle in the 1900s, workers found an obliette behind a wall in the chapel. 
At the bottom of the shaft were many human skeletons on wooden spikes. When cleaned out, it took three cartloads to remove the bones. Today, the dungeon is now covered over in order to keep people away from it. It's believed that the O'Carrolls would drop guests through the trapdoor to be impaled on the spikes eight feet below and could be haunted by the people killed by the O'Carrolls. The castle describes itself as the world's most haunted house due to the numerous amounts of spirits located here. In fifth place, we have Pendle Hill, also known as Penhall. Pendle Hill is located in the Lancashire countryside near the villages of Burnley, Colne, Pattyham, Clitheroe, and Nelson. Pendle Hill is famous for George Fox's visitation, the Quaker movement leader in 1652, and the barometer experiments of Richard Townley in 1661. I feel like I'm missing something else they were famous for. Let's see if I can get the uh, gray matter in here working. Oh, oh right, it's home to a very famous witch trial. Locals to the area know very well the story of the 10 women executed for witchcraft at Pendle Hill in the 17th century, who, uh, you know, still haunt the area. The story of the Pendle witches is an excellent example of a well-documented allegation of witchcraft. So this tale begins way back in the year 1612, when there was said to be a family of local peasants who lived in a vast limestone tower. However, the family was no ordinary family. These peasants had enormous powers and were reported to be in league with the devil. According to reports, the family made clay effigies out of teeth and uh, human hair. In a coincidence that's going to surprise absolutely no one, local people died of various mysterious illnesses or great pains at the time. The milk in the area turned sour and uh, cattle died mysteriously as well. People were kind of afraid to go up that hill. A local magistrate, Roger Norwell, made the decision to arrest two people living in the tower. They were brought to Lancaster for trial and two days later, the rest of the witches were arrested and also taken to Lancaster for trial. Out of the 12 folks on trial, one passed during the proceedings. Meetings. Another one was found not guilty, and the other ten were, uh, yeah, very much found guilty. On August 20th of 1612, all ten accused witches went to the way of the rope necklace at Gallows Hill. The history of the witch trials has given the place an eerie atmosphere and uh, several terrifying reports. Pendle Hill was featured on the show Most Haunted, during which several supernatural events are said to have taken place, including members of the show's crew being injured. Most of the ghostly activity is said to be out of spite from the witches, who continue to call Pendle Hill their cursed home. One tale of haunting and particular took place during a Ouija board experiment. Is my disdain showing yet? The stupidity was happening in the foundations of Malkin Tower, when a tooth suddenly landed on the center of the table. Now this caused everyone present to be extremely concerned, and after having obviously checked to ensure that nobody in the group had lost a tooth, which was, you know, definitely human, it left the folks involved in a quandary as to how it got there. The tooth was eventually identified as belonging to an adult of around 40 years of age, and was in fact an old tooth. And if, you know, a league of ticked off witches wasn't enough ghosties for y'all, a Bronze Age burial site has been discovered at the hill summit. You know, just a little bonus. In fourth place, we have Stirling, Scotland. This beautiful market town has played a pivotal role in the history of Scotland, along with playing host to multiple grisly stories and, you know, unsettled spirits. The imposing hilltop, Stirling Castle, is home to several ghosts, and I'm struggling to decide who to talk about in detail. Hmm, probably one of the mysterious ladies. Oh. I know, the green lady. It is believed that she was a servant girl in the employ of Mary, Queen of Scots, and a very gifted one at that, who was blessed with the powers of foretelling, or second sight. So this maiden had a premonition that if her queen slept even one night within the ancient fortress, she would not live to see dawn. So she told her mistress of the fears, and thankfully, Mary listened and offered to allow the girl to watch over her as she slept, and you know, call for aid should any threat present itself. Through the long, dark night, our servant gal sat, bundled in a great soft chair, guarding her beloved queen. Weary from a long journey, Mary fell into a deep slumber as soon as her head hit the pillow. And this girl too was kind of weary. She barred the door and lighting a taper, sat by the bedside. There she sat for what seemed like an eternity, near hypnotized by the flickering of the taper's end. But try as she might, she could not resist the weariness in her bones. Her limbs grew heavy, her eyelids heavier still, and decided, you know, that maybe closing her eyes for a minute wouldn't hurt since she was so exhausted. Hey, we've all been there. But what seems like no more than a few moments, she opened them again, blinking against the sudden brightness of the chamber. She, uh, you know, through bleary eyes, tried to call out, but found her throat so dry and realized that the tiny taper, set so carefully by the queen's cot, had fallen, lighting the bedclothes and tapestries on fire. Coughing, she darted from her chair, gathering the deeply sleeping queen in her arms, and carried her towards the door, barely managing to get her to safety before eventually passing from smoke inhalation. Sadly, her name has been forgotten. She is known only by the color of the gown she wore, the Green Lady. So visitors to Sterling should be mindful that their female phantoms have one thing in common. Yep, yeah, I said phantoms. 
plural. It is said that whosoever looks even once into their eyes won't make it through the night. So if you notice like a ruffled robe or a well-turned spectral heel as you're passing around, turn away, avert your gaze, because you don't want to risk your soul. Some say that Queen Mary herself haunts the castle, roaming the grounds in a pink dress. The Darnley Coffee House on Bow Street is also said to be haunted by a mischievous poltergeist, while the Old Town Jail is home to the spirit of the last man that went the way of the rope necklace on sight. Number 3. Akigara Forest Akigara Forest is often known as the sea of trees. It's a hauntingly beautiful park in Japan that carries a dark reputation. Hundreds of people over the years have come to Akigara to take their own life, leading to its infamous and dark distinction. Spiritualists and paranormal investigators in Japan believe that because there have been so many tragic deaths that happened in Akigara, the forest itself is literally growing denser, and the paranormal activity and dark energy inside as well. This seemingly serene forest has been host to all kind of dark rumors, with some stating that the forest is hallowed ground haunted by demonic spirits for years. Others claim that the forest drives people to madness due to high deposits of iron which cause compasses to malfunction, meaning travelers would get hopelessly lost. Some visitors to Akigara forest report hearing screams, wallowing, or crying while walking through the trees. There's no doubt that there's probably a very dark feeling walking through these trees knowing everything that's ever transpired there. As well, there's something about the knotted mess of all the branches and bark that seems sort of surreal, not quite of this earth, but maybe that's just the legends doing the work for me. Japanese authorities have been doing their best to try and reclaim the forest's haunted reputation, putting up signposts all over to try and deter anyone who would take their own life to instead reach out, call for authorities, and they're no longer publicizing any cases of this happening, hoping to one day salvage the tormented reputation of an otherwise serene spot. Number 2. Paveglia I've talked about Paveglia on this channel before, and I almost kind of can't resist bringing it up again because I just find it so fascinating. Describing Paveglia sounds like Italy was intentionally trying to make the setting to a horror movie. It's just off the coast of Venice. Initially the island served as a quarantine zone for those suffering from the plague. Infected were shipped off to Paveglia to wait out their final days. The trouble was, a lot of the people who would end up getting sent to Paveglia weren't even sick at all, showing minor to no symptoms at all. However, that probably changed pretty quickly once they were sent to a quarantine zone of exclusively sick people. It's said that the ground on Paveglia is so hallowed that there's more ash from human remains than there is soil on the island. Huh. Eventually, in 1922, Paveglia underwent a bit of a rebranding since centuries of being known as the quarantine zone was hurting its image and its tourist economy, and it rebranded as an island home to a mental hospital. Now, of course, this mental hospital was home to doctors who performed sick experiments on their patients, often with little to no care for the patient's well-being. Chisels, drills, lobotomies without any form of anesthetic or proper treatment, all these fun things. It's said that the lead doctor at the facility was eventually so overcome with guilt over what he had done, and haunted by the screams and spirits of his patients and victims, that he would eventually throw himself off of the tower on the center of the island. Now, to deter all you would-be ghost hunters and paranormal enthusiasts out there who think Paveglia is sounding like the holy grail of haunted spots, I should warn you that you are probably not going to get in there, as it is extremely forbidden to enter. As in, it's illegal. It's punishable to the fullest extent of the law, and is considered a criminal act to trespass onto Paveglia. But a better question is why would you even want to? Some spirits are better left unbothered. At the number one spot is Pripyat, the town outside of Chernobyl, the famed nuclear reactor. 50,000 people used to live here and now it's a ghost town. Sorry, couldn't resist. It's difficult to summarize just exactly what happened in Chernobyl in under a two minute time frame, but you know, we can gloss over some of the big details for you. An overload at a nearby reactor caused a nuclear meltdown that ended up causing one of the worst ecological disasters in human history. A massive chain of unfortunate events had to all happen for the incident to play out the way it did, and unfortunately that's exactly how it went. It's a fascinating case and there are tons and tons of documents and things to read about it, and you should after this video because it it's fascinating. 50,000 people had to be evacuated basically 
basically overnight, and Pripyat turned into a ghost town, now standing as a harrowing monument to the dangers of unchecked nuclear power. Photos from inside Pripyat almost don't look real. They look like something out of a post-apocalyptic movie, and I guess that kind of makes sense because it is post-apocalyptic when you think about it. Unlike a lot of the others on this list, Pripyat doesn't need any supernatural ghost stories to elicit a sense of fear. It's haunted, definitely, but more so by radiation and unease than anything else. Mutated animals and vegetation, abandoned ferris wheels, and an unmissable sense of dread in the air certainly paint a picture of one of the Earth's darkest spots. To some, Pripyat is the ultimate dark tourist destination, infamous and wholly unique. There's actually a whole subculture around venturing into the zone for recreation, a group of people who call themselves Stalkers after the 1972 film and not the first person shooter RPG series set in Chernobyl. These people illegally trespass into the surrounding areas of Chernobyl for the ultimate urban exploration thrill. Now there are guided tours as well of Chernobyl's surrounding areas for those who are less familiar with the dangers of the zone but want to get up and close and personal nonetheless. Coming in at number 5 we have the Bangara Fort India. The Bangara Fort is a 17th century fort built in Rajasthan, India originally being built by the Bhagwant Das for his younger son Madho Singh. According to legend a Sudhu, also known as a holy person, named Baba Balak Nath lived within the fort area and it was his injunction that any house built built in the precinct of the fort should not be taller than his own, and if the shadow of any such house fell on his, it would result in destruction of the fort. Another tale states that a wizard adept in black magic fell in love with a beautiful princess who had many suitors. One day the wizard followed her to the marketplace and offered her a love potion, however she refused, throwing it onto a large rock that consequently rolled onto the wizard and was said to have crushed him to death. However, before his death it was said that the disgruntled sorcerer put a curse on the fort, which resulted in folks fleeing and the site remaining uninhabited. If you prefer your vacations to be on the spiritual side, you can visit the fort. However, its crumbling rocks and abandoned structures make it incredibly unsettling. You have been warned. Coming in at number 4 we have the Fairmont Banff Springs Hotel, Canada. The Fairmont Banff Springs Hotel is an historic hotel located in Banff, Alberta, okay, one of my favourite places on earth. Got it right here. Banff. <laughs> the entire town is situated in Banff National Park, with the hotel overlooking a valley towards Mount Rundle. The hotel opened its doors back in 1888 by the Canadian Pacific Railway as one of the earliest of Canada's Grand Railway hotels. In 1926, though, a fire destroyed the original structure, with a replacement being built in 1928. As of right now, the hotel welcomes many tourists from around the world who want to explore the beauty of Banff. However, it gets a tad more gothic once you get inside the hotel. The Calgary Herald has reported that the hotel houses several ghosts, including a bride who was said to have fallen down the stone staircase during her wedding, which is tragic and absolutely devastating. However, there is a less upsetting one. Sam the Bellman is also said to be a lingering ghost at the Banff Springs Hotel. He worked there until 1975 and claimed he would come back to haunt the hotel after he was gone, and that he did. According to some, he supposedly pulls shifts to help people with their bags before disappearing into thin air. In third place we have Edinburgh, Scotland. So the beautiful city of Edinburgh is well known for its ghostly activity. For starters, the South Bridge vaults are haunted by several different ghosts. During the Irish potato famine of 1845-47, to thousands of Irish folks immigrated to Scotland seeking, you know, survival. Forced into the vaults under the bridge, as many as 10 people lived in a single room. The conditions were poorer than the tenants. Crowded and damp with barely any air circulation. And just like that, the area quickly became Edinburgh's uh, red light district. Services of the night, please tell me you get what I'm referencing. Gambling and a thriving black market were commonplace in the vaults. By the late 19th century, the vaults were closed off for good. In an effort to drive the um, seedy activity out from under Edinburgh's main thoroughfare. For decades these vaults sat empty as their icky past slipped into obscurity. Obscurity that ended in 1998 when a local man crawled through a narrow passageway in one of his buildings and rediscovered the rooms underneath the bridge. Since then the cavernous vaults of Southbridge have been open to the public and the reports of ghosts have poured in. Honestly, what have I said about leaving hidden spaces that are blocked off B? Nothing good comes from opening them. Witnesses have claimed to feel cold gusts of air, hear voices, and to see and sense an intangible presence. Some ghosts are quite bold, like the, um, 
spectral youngling Jack, who likes to grab visitors' hands in the wine vaults. You know, just for funsies. While another more menacing presence is known as Mr. Boots. He's an unkept man that was named for his, you know, tall footwear. He lurks in the back section of the vault and has been known to uh, push and throw rocks at visitors. Some have claimed to hear his footsteps on the cobbles and his echoing voice cursing throughout the chambers. It's even rumored that in the 1820s, the infamous serial killers William Burke and William Hare lurked within the vault, killing some of their 17 victims there and storing the bodies in that same location until they were sold off for medical dissections. Visitors to Edinburgh Castle also frequently report sightings of apparitions. A young piper who disappeared without a trace hundreds of years ago can still be heard today, with the faint haunting sound of a lost soul. As well as the story of the Manish Piper, the dungeons are frequented by a headless drummer boy and a gaggle of French prisoners captured during the Seven Year War who are regularly sighted in and around the castle. If you hear the bark of a dog in Edinburgh's old town, yet there's nothing there, it could be Bobby, a phantom sky terrier that is known to all in the city. The faithful hound spent 14 years guarding his master's grave until he finally passed away in 1872 and was buried in Greyfriars Kirkland, near his owner. People still hear his little bark near his grave. A small statue of Greyfriars Bobby is a popular landmark on the corner of Candlemaker Row, and it's good luck to rub Bobby's nose. Aw, here I am tempted to plan a trip, mainly to give a good ghost doggy a pet. Oh, almost forgot. Greyfriars is a graveyard that dates back to the 16th century and is the resting place of several infamous characters, but the most gruesome story is that of uh, B L O O D Y. Mackenzie. Look, the interwebs really don't like when I say that word, so bear with me here. This wealthy lord was tasked with punishing hundreds of prisoners who refused to change their religion. Locals believe that the ghost of Mackenzie haunts the graveyard after his tomb was disturbed by a homeless man who broke into the graveyard at night. As soon as he laid hands on the tomb, the floor opened up beneath him and he dropped into a shallow grave containing plague victims. Since then, many other freaky episodes have taken place nearby. A woman was found unconscious with bruises around her neck, and many claim that it was Mackenzie's poltergeist, continuing his evil deeds and death as he did in life. No biggie. In second place, we have Canterbury Kent. While this medieval city might be aesthetically stunning, it has quite the dark past. The ghosties here tend to be a little more spread out than other places and have different tales, so let's have fun with some short and sweet descriptions. For starters, Canterbury Cathedral, a pilgrimage site for centuries, is the home to many restless spirits. Archbishop of Canterbury was famously and brutally killed by the King's Knights in 1170. Beckett's place of death has a large welded cross above it with two swords. His tomb can be found near the high altar, where his apparition still appears to visitors. Other cathedral ghosts include a nun and the ghost of Simon of Sudbury, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury from around 1375. Other paranormal hotspots in Canterbury include Tiny Tim's Tea Room, haunted by the spirits of three younglings whose remains were found within the walls during restoration. And hey, if you hang around Hawks Road, you might glimpse Abigail, a sad soul who frequents the area. Another spooky house in the area is the Bishop's Finger, which is located on St. Dunstan Street. In the 19th century, a housekeeper by the name of Ellen Bleen discovered that her employer, a priest was having an uh, affair with a younger woman. It is said that Ellen poisoned the pair with a meat pie and then uh, vanished from the city. Shortly afterwards, it was discovered that she had been buried alive as her body was found nearby. Ellen is said to wander the streets and manifest herself in the bishop's finger every Friday. She's described as, you know, plain face, larger lady, in a long white skirt and a mob cap. There are more haunted places in Canterbury, but sadly, I don't have all the time I would like to go into more detail. In first place, we have the village of Pluckley, included in the Guinness Book of Records as the most haunted place in Britain, the Kentish village of Pluckley's popularity amongst ghosts and ghouls had to make it the number one spot on our list today. Wandering monks, decapitated highwaymen, and all manner of central casting spirits reside here, but special attention should be paid to the particularly gruesome story of the Pluckley watercress lady. Seen smoking a clay pipe and living on the banks of the river about a century ago, the woman would sell watercress to the locals and drink gin from a flask, my kind of lady. Falling asleep one evening, it is believed that her pipe scattered ashes onto her rags and she uh, burnt to death. So nowadays, a pink glowing specter can allegedly be spotted at the exact location where she went up in flames. Now, before someone asks why this place is scarier than the others on today's list, you know, other ghosties who frequent in the town include uh, the specter of the highwaymen who hide in a tree at Pinnock, a phantom coach and horses who pop up in several areas around the village, the ghost of a Romani woman who drowned in a stream, a miller who has been seen at Mill Hill, the hanging body of a schoolmaster in Dickie Buss's Lane, a colonel who hanged himself in Park Wood, a man smothered by a wall of clay who drowned at the brickworks, the lady of Rose Court, who is said to have poisoned herself in despair over a love triangle, the White Lady, a young woman who was apparently buried inside seven coffins and an oak sarcophagus, who haunts St. Nicholas's Church, but not to be confused with the Red Lady, reputably a member of the family who haunts the churchyard of St. Nicholas's Church. Oh, and a small white 
dog has also been reported in the same location. Now, I don't know about y'all watching, but that's a few more ghosties than I'd like to see in a smaller town. And the fact that they like to roam and not stay in one spot? Hard pass. Number five in this list is LA's Black Dahlia Murder House. Yep, just another murder house on the list of homes that you can buy. Top 10 real estate deal says, tales of terror and tragedy rarely last as long as one of the most notorious Hollywood mysteries of the last century, the Block Dahlia Murders. Rumors still abound about the home's previous owner, Los Angeles doctor George Hodel, and his involvement in the brutal killing, mutilation, and dismemberment of Elizabeth Short. Elizabeth was sliced in half at her waist and all the blood drained from her body. It looked like the work of a skilled surgeon. The house, an unusual piece of architecture crafted by Lloyd Wright, looks like it is cut straight out of an Indiana Jones movie. While a $2 million renovation has brought the house back to its original splendor, one can still feel that they should be running for their life through the house while being chased by Dr. Hodel. The house was recently on the market at $4.7 million and has been the backdrop for multiple Hollywood movies, TV shows such as Ghost Hunters and Paranormal America and even an American Express commercial. Sliced in half, guys. Like, not just cut a little bit, literally sliced in half. You woke up as one person and now you are two pieces of that one person. Yeah, that's an absolute no from me. This was a horrible killing and one that has left its dark mark on the home and made it very haunted. I don't care how much you try to renovate this place or anything like that, nothing will ever be able to get out the spirit that lingers. Elizabeth will not leave and frankly, if I was sliced in half, I'd be pretty pissed about the whole ordeal as well. She takes her anger out on those that come here. The people that live here talk about her quite frequently. And maybe the craziest part about this is that that's a selling point. This home is going for almost $5 million even though someone was literally sliced in half and their ghost now runs rampant through the home. $5 million is a lot of money and spending all of it to get harassed by a ghost torso? Yeah, doesn't seem like the best investment. Number four on this list is the Gardet Le Pretre Haunted Mansion. Mansions are cool, I would love to own one. The second you throw the word haunted in front of the word mansion though, I am no longer interested. Top 10 real estate deal says, the Gardet Le Pretre Mansion, or more locally referred to as the Sultan's House, has been photographed and heralded in articles from the time it was built in the 1830s. Having hosted the cream of New Orleans society from the beginning of its rich history, the home comes with a scary story. One morning, as neighbors were walking by the Sultan House, they saw blood trickling from under the front door. The police were notified and had to break into the house only to find that all inhabitants had been murdered with swords or axes and the Sultan was found brutalized and buried alive in the backyard. It was always felt that the murders were executed by his brother, the real Sultan, as retribution for the theft of his fortune and many of his wives. How much is local lore and how much is true, we will never know for sure. This is, after all, New Orleans. Only a block from Bourbon Street, the French Quarter style home with 9 bedrooms and 10 baths most recently was on the market at $2.65 million. We are talking about a place that has had multiple murders go down. Like literally a full on massacre happened here and people want to spend over $2 million on it? How do we know that there isn't more dead bodies hidden somewhere in the house? Like under the floorboards or deeper in the backyard. This home is deeply haunted and I want no part of it. In at number 3, Avodny Canal, St. Petersburg, Russia. Avodny Canal is the longest canal in St. Petersburg, Russia, which in the 19th century served as the southern limit of the city. The canal was dug in 1769 and by the late 19th century, after the Industrial Revolution, it had effectively become a sewer, collecting wastewater of adjacent industrial enterprises. Nowadays, the channel is very shallow. Navigation is allowed, but only for small craft. Running 5 miles through the city, the canal since goes by another name, a much more sinister name, Suicide Canal. Ever since the canal's construction back in the 18th century, strange events have surrounded the area, some of which included the construction workers complaining of headaches, sudden outbursts of violence and of course, as the name states, suicides. Now while most attempts were successful, those who survived their attempts have claimed that they didn't know why they jumped in the water, and that it felt as though an invisible force was pulling them off the 
riverbanks and into the murky depths. Some even claim that the force comes from the restless souls lurking beneath the water, with some survivors even claiming to see a woman in white floating in the water before suddenly disappearing. Very spooky indeed. So if you ever find yourself in St. Petersburg, I would suggest steering clear of the Obvodny Canal. Coming in at number 2, The Stanley Hotel Colorado The Stanley Hotel is a colonial revival hotel located in Colorado, approximately 5 miles from the Rocky Mountain National Park. The hotel was built by Freeland Oscar Stanley of Stanley Steamer fame and opened its doors on July 4, 1909 as a resort for upper class easterners and a health retreat for sufferers of pulmonary tuberculosis. Now, More importantly, The Stanley Hotel served as the inspiration for the Overlook Hotel in Stephen King's novel The Shining, as well as the filming location for the 1997 miniseries. In the fall of 1974, Stephen King and his wife stopped for a night at the old hotel, during which time the hotel had fallen on hard times and was a ghost of its former self. Upon arriving, King learned that the hotel was closing for the winter and that only a skeleton crew would remain. Despite that, the couple checked into room 217, the presidential suite, and were the only paying customers there at the time. That night, according to King, he had a nightmare in which he saw his young son being chased down the hallway of the hotel by a possessed fire hose. He woke up in a sweat, stepped onto the balcony for a cigarette, and by the time he went back inside, he had worked out the bones for what would eventually be his third novel, The Shining. Honestly, that story gives me chills. Despite a peaceful early history in the years following the release of The Shining, the hotel gained a reputation as a setting for paranormal activity. Not to mention, it has hosted numerous paranormal investigators, appearing in shows such as Ghost Hunters and Ghost Adventures. On top of that, the hotel offers guided tours which features spaces reputed to be exceptionally haunted. And finally, coming in at number 1, we have Castle of Good Hope, Cape Town, South Africa. The Castle of Good Hope, known to the Cape Town residents as the Castle, is a fort built all the way back in the 17th century by the Dutch East Indian Company and is the oldest existing building in South Africa. The fort was built to act as a replenishment station for ships passing the treacherous coast around the Cape on voyages between the Netherlands and the Dutch East Indies, now Indonesia. The fortress was said to have housed a church, a bakery, workshops, living quarters, shop cells and various other facilities. In 1936, the castle was declared an historical monument, making it the first site in South Africa to be protected. However, like the rest of the numbers on this list, the castle is home to some otherworldly residents. Back in the 1700s, Governor Peter Van Noot was said to have condemned several men to be hanged to death, with one of the men cursing the governor from the gallows. Creepier still, Van Noot went on to die later that day of a heart attack. According to the official website of the castle, his ghost has been haunting the grounds ever since. Coming in at number 5, Hill of Crosses in Lithuania. Located in Lithuania, the Hill of Crosses is a site of pilgrimage about 12 kilometers north of the city of Sholay. Now, the precise origin of the crosses is unknown, but it is believed that the first crosses were placed on the former Damante Hill Fort after the 1831 uprising. The uprising was of course known as the Polish-Russian War and was an armed rebellion in the heartland of Partition. Poland against the Russian Empire. Ever since then, not only crosses and crucifixes, but also statues of the Virgin Mary have appeared on the Hill of Crosses, as well as carvings of Lithuanian patriots, and thousands upon thousands of tiny effigies and rosaries have been brought here by Catholic pilgrims. Now, as you would expect, the exact number of all these items is unknown, but it is estimated to range between 50,000 to 100,000. Over the years, the place has come to signify the peaceful and endurance of Lithuanian Catholicism, despite the threats it faced throughout history. Throughout history, the Hill of Crosses has been used as a place for Lithuanians to pray for peace for their country and for the loved ones they had lost during the wars of independence. The hill eventually became a place of defiance once again during Soviet occupation from 1944 to 1991. The hill and crosses were bulldozed by Soviets three times, but locals kept rebuilding it. So sweet. In at number 4, Myrtles Plantation, USA. The Myrtles Plantation is a historic home and former antebellum plantation in St. Francisville, Louisiana. Built in 1976, it is considered to be one of America's most haunted homes, with a variety of legends surrounding the plantation. Now, one of the reasons Myrtles is believed to be so damn haunted is because it is rumored to be on top of an ancient Tunica Indian burial ground. As of right now, it is currently a bed and breakfast, an 
and offers historical and mystery tours. As I previously mentioned though, it is considered to be one of the most haunted homes in the United States, with it rumoured to be home to at least 12 ghosts and is often reported that 10 murders occurred in the house, but historical records only indicate the murder of one. William Winter. William Drew Winter is also a very popular character in the plantation. He was an attorney who lived in the home before being shot by a stranger. It has been said that after he was shot, he staggered inside the home and died trying to climb the stairs. He died on the 17th step. Even today, visitors still claim to hear his dying footsteps. Number three on this list is the Boulder House. Ever wanted to get abducted by aliens? Well, now you can. Top 10 Real Estate Deals says, During the construction of their new home next to a mysterious pile of ancient rocks in Arizona, a young couple from Washington discovered that they weren't the first people to live in the boulders. Pottery shards and rock carvings were dated by experts back as far as 1,000 years. Then they found something even more astonishing, a Stonehenge type phenomenon that occurs on both the spring and fall equinoxes. A 6 inch wide beam of light that starts in the glass between two boulders and slowly works its way across the floor and up the wall to a 36 inch spiral petroglyph. When the sun hits its mark, the stone projections light up like diamonds. What does it mean? Some people think it's a signal to space creatures, a light that will guide their spaceships to the Arizona desert. Or maybe it doesn't mean anything, just a freak of nature. Whatever it might be, it started over a thousand years ago when the Boulder people first began living here about the same time that the hard shelled life forms first showed up on Earth. A dream home for archaeologists, historians, artists, or mystery lovers, the Boulder House on 9 acres with 4,380 square feet, 3 bedrooms, 2 baths, and a great room with a massive fireplace was recently for sale at $4.2 million. It is is now off the market. So for the low price of $4.2 million, you can call some aliens over and hope that they come for dinner. Then after dessert, get jetted up to their ship where they will proceed to perform experiments on you. Yeah, that's a big no thank you from me. The home sounds cool as hell, just minus the literal extraterrestrial visitors. Number two on this list is the Linwood Hall. Linwood Hall is maybe the biggest haunted house in the world. Top 10 Real Estate Deal says, Proof that wealth does not bring happiness is shown by the tragedies experienced by the A.B. Widener family who built the 110 room Linwood Hall in Pennsylvania. Said to be the largest remaining example of neoclassical revival architecture from the Gilded Age, its decline began with links to the sinking of the Titanic. When Widener invested with JP Morgan in the White Star Line, little did he know that his son and grandson would die on the maiden voyage of its flagship, Titanic. Consumed with guilt and grief, A.B. Widener died in his grand mansion three years after the sinking. It is said that the three Widener ghosts are still its caretakers and its legacy continues to be the world's biggest abandoned ghost house. Linwood Hall was listed at 20 million in 2014 and dropped to 16.5 million in 2015. It still hasn't sold. I mean, if these ghosts were actually going to be caretakers, that'd be pretty cool. From what I've heard though, they don't always just leave it at that. These ghosts, as with many paranormal entities, like to cause problems. For close to 20 mil, I want my home problem free. And finally, number one on this list is the Amityville Horror House. Now you guys probably know this home because it often makes all the lists associated with Ed and Lorraine Warren, but did you know that you could actually buy it? Well, in all honesty, you can't purchase it anymore because it's off the market, but a few years ago you could have. Top 10 Real Estate Deal says, The New York home where Ronald Defoe got up in the middle of the night in 1974 and brutally murdered his parents and four siblings with a rifle while they slept. The home was occupied just a year later by the Lutz family until they were forced to leave because of the rampant paranormal activity. The storied horror house on the Ocean Avenue waterfront is today an extensively remodeled home. The 5,000 square foot home most recently sold in 2017 for just $605,000. This is one of the most haunted homes in the history of the planet, folks, and someone bought it. I'm surprised that it's even still standing, to be honest, and somebody hasn't completely demolished it since all the haunting reports came out. I don't even want to go into the same area as this home, let alone buy it and live in it. 
but if that's something that floats your boat, then apparently you could have. Coming in at five, Casa della Tubos, also known as the House of Tubes. This is perhaps one of the most popular haunted places in Mexico because of its exemplary spiral make and cylindrical hallways. Specifically, one house in Monterrey, Mexico, has caused a lot of buzz amongst locals as well as urban legend fanatics. According to some sources, there is a very famous legend about an abandoned building called the House of Tubes, a strange structure built in the 1970s but was never inhabited. From the outside of the house, it looks almost like a set of grey concrete tubes standing on end, and on the inside, the hallways are cylindrical in shape. One side of the house also has a series of ramps that lead to upper floors, and on the side, the levels are connected by large stairs. Now, the legend goes that the house was built by a wealthy couple who had a paralyzed daughter. The father, of course, wanted to create a special home that was custom made just for her, hence the ramps leading from floor to floor, allowing her to move freely in her wheelchair. However, when construction began, her father took her to see the new home, during which time two of the architects who designed the property died after concrete fell on them. However, the construction continued. After construction, the father returned with his daughter, who decided to test out the new ramps, going up and down from floor to floor. However, her parents looked away for just a few moments when their daughter's wheelchair suddenly started to slide backwards down the ramp. She was unable to stop herself, and the girl went flying out of the open window, falling to her death. The home was left abandoned, but visitors report seeing a little girl stood near the window she fell from, as well as the sounds of weeping from the lost soul. Coming in at four, House of Mummies, Guanajuato. In the city of Guanajuato lies Mexico's most eccentric museum that has quickly sparked ghostly rumors. The museum houses naturally mummified bodies interred during a cholera outbreak around Guanajuato, Mexico in 1833. The bodies were supposedly disinterred between 1870 and 1958, during which time a local tax was in place requiring a fee to be paid for perpetual burial. Bodies for which the tax was not paid were disinterred, and some, those in the best condition, were stored in a nearby building. Now, the cause of the mummification is a unique combination of mineral rich soils and an extremely dry climate. And according to locals, the preserved bodies have been known to move, whisper, and even weep. As of 2007, the museum continued to exhibit 59 of the total 111 mummies in the collection. The mummies are a notable part of Mexican pop culture, echoing the national holiday, the Day of the Dead, as well as the B movie titled Santo vs. the Mummies of Guanajuato, which pitted well known professional wrestler Santo and several others against reanimated mummies. Coming in at number three, Battleship Island, Nagasaki, Japan. Also known as Hashima Island, this is the abandoned island nearby the city of Nagasaki in southern Japan and is one of 505 uninhabited islands in Nagasaki Prefecture. In the 1950s, it was a bustling place, home to thousands of coal mine workers and families. However, ever since the coal mine shut down in 1974, it has remained abandoned. As petroleum replaced coal in Japan in the 1960s, coal mines began to close across the country, with Mitsubishi officially closing the mine in January 1974, and the island was completely cleared by April of the same year. Today, its most notable features are the abandoned and still mostly intact apartment buildings, the surrounding sea walls, and its distinctive profile shape. In 2009, Japan requested to include Hashima Island, along with 22 other industrial sites, in the UNESCO World Heritage Site list, which was initially opposed by South Korean authorities on the grounds that Korean and Chinese forced laborers were used on the island prior and during World War II. Although Hashima was entirely closed off until 2009, travelers are now allowed to visit with it being recognized by UNESCO in 2015. You may also recognize the site from the big screen with it serving as the secret headquarters of Bond villain Raoul Silver in the 2012 movie Skyfall. In at two, Lizzie Borden's house, Fall River, Massachusetts. Now, for those who don't know, the Lizzie Borden house is where Lizzie Borden and her family lived, and is located on 232nd Street in the city of Fall River, Massachusetts. Born Lizzie Andrew Borden, sucks for her, she was an American woman who was the main suspect in the August 4th, 1892 axe murders of her father and stepmother. However, Borden was tried and ultimately acquitted of the murders. The case received widespread newspaper 
newspaper coverage throughout the United States. And following her release from jail, where she was held during the trial, Borden chose to remain in the house her parents had been killed in, despite being ostracized by her other residents. Now, because the Commonwealth of Massachusetts elected to not charge anyone with the murder that occurred over 127 years ago, a ton of speculation about the crimes have continued on. Now, Lizzie spent the rest of her life in the home up until her death at age 66, just days before the death of her sister Emma. The house has been operated as a bed and breakfast since 1996 under the ownership of Martha McGinn, who inherited the home. According to Martha McGinn, the room where Lizzie's stepmother Abby Borden was found murdered is the most requested room at the bed and breakfast. Guests who stay, not just in Abby's room, but in the home as a whole, have reported all manners of strange sightings in the home. Would you dare stay there? I would. I would stay in every room. And finally coming in at number 1, Chernobyl, Pripyat, Ukraine. Pripyat is a ghost city in northern Ukraine named after the nearby Pripyat River and was founded on February 4th 1970 as the ninth nuclear city in the Soviet Union to serve the nearby Chernobyl nuclear power plant. The city was officially proclaimed in 1979 and had grown to a population of 49,360. By the time it was evacuated on April 27th 1986, the day after the Chernobyl disaster. Now the Chernobyl disaster disaster was a nuclear disaster which occurred on April 26, 1986 at the nuclear power plant not far from Pripyat, and was considered to be the worst nuclear disaster in history, and is also one of the only two nuclear energy disasters rated at 7, the maximum severity on the international nuclear event scale. The other being the 2011 Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster in Japan. Ever since the nuclear disaster in Pripyat, the city has remained entirely uninhabited since the evacuation, although the buildings, furniture and all other signs of life are exactly where the former citizens left them. It is a city frozen in time, plates still out, dolls left on beds and even a haunting fairground ride waiting to be used. Weathered books can be found in classrooms and abandoned photographs are still hanging on walls in their original frames. There are strict rules regarding the site considering the sheer amount of radiation in the area, however, following the airing of HBO's Chernobyl series, Ukraine's government have announced that the site will become an official tourist attraction. Will you be checking it out? I personally don't want to die, so I won't. Coming in at number five, we have the Lizzie Borden House in Massachusetts. Lizzie Borden was an American woman who became the center of a sensational trial in the United States. In 1892, she was accused of killing her father and stepmother. Her family was well off and lived in the town of Fall River in Massachusetts. Her father had remarried three years after Lizzie's mother had died. Lizzie also had an older sister, Emma. They often argued with their father regarding their finances and their stepmother. Lizzie was well liked in the community and spent her days involved with various charity work. Her father was not well liked though, he was known to be stubborn and cruel. On the morning of August 4th, 1892, Mr. Borden left his home for work. Left in the house was Lizzie, the stepmother and a live-in mate. Her sister was out of town at the time. When he returned from work, it was reported that he sat down in the living room and had a nap. No one knows exactly what happened to Mr. and Mrs. Borden next, but Lizzie gave her version of events. Lizzie claims to have returned home at around 11.15. Upon her return, she found her father brutally attacked on the sofa. Upstairs, his wife's body was found mutilated. It was later confirmed she had died around an hour before her husband. There was little evidence to what had actually happened to the Bordens. Lizzie had suspicious activity that made it seem likely that she was involved. On August 3rd, Lizzie had purchased some poisonous acid. It was also found that she had burned some of her clothing on the stove and in the days following the murder. The maid was also suspected of the killing. She was seen leaving the home carrying an unexamined parcel in the evening following the murder. No weapon was ever found, though they did suspect the axe that was found in the basement. Lizzie was arrested and tried but was acquitted due to the lack of evidence. Was widely believed she was guilty. She was shunned by her community. She would stay in the family home until she died of old age in 1927. The house is reportedly haunted by both Lizzie's spirit and Mr. and Mrs. Borden. Coming in at number 4 we have Merchant House Museum in New York. The Merchant House is the only 19th century family home that has been preserved. 
preserved. The house was built in 1832 by a wealthy merchant. The merchant Seabury Treadwell raised his family in the home. He had eight children. The home was never empty as the family contently grew with four servants, nieces, nephews, cousins, and aunts all staying at the home from time to time. Most of the family lived there until their old age. The youngest daughter, Gertrude, lived there alone for 24 years after the death of her older sister. She was eccentric and became obsessed with holding on to the family home in its original state. The neighborhood around her home was run down. Many of the homes around it were demolished. As you can see today, the home stands alone in its elegance. After she died in 1933, a distant cousin purchased the house to ensure it was not demolished. He turned the home into a museum, a time capsule of what it was like to live in the 19th century. Still has the original possessions from the family. Not everything in the home was idyllic. There are some ghosts that linger in the home, other than those of the family members who refused to leave even in death. There is a famous story, the thief who tried to steal from the family. It was said he broke in one night while the family slept. He stole a lot of jewels and valuables from the home. He was attempting to make his escape through a hole he had made in one of the weaker walls. As he squeezed through the hole, the wall collapsed on top of him. He did not survive. He was found by the family in the morning. The thief's brother apparently demanded justice. He claimed that the wall should not have been made so poorly. It was the bad quality of the wall that killed his brother. Obviously, this was not seen as a valid concern. The thief's ghost is reported to still be lingering in the home. Luckily, the house is now a museum and not a hotel, so you shouldn't have too much trouble with the ghosts. There have been various sightings. Someone saw one of the daughters sat in the garden as they walked towards the girls. She disappeared. A man covered in a dust-like soot had been seen around the kitchen, believed to be the thief. Many guests feel cold spots around the house. At least the majority of the ghosts are friendly. The Treadwell family are just enjoying their beloved home. Coming in at three, the Tasquana Station, Mexico City. Perhaps one of the most haunted spots in the wide networks of public transportation in Mexico, this station holds the reputation of being the scariest station on the metro route. Many locals believe the station to be haunted, with an elderly man reportedly haunting solo commuters who are waiting on the platform. However, don't fret, he is said to be friendly. Rumor has it the man died during an assault at the station and is now lingering around the station, protecting passengers from a similar fate. Whether you find this scary is up to you, but personally I wouldn't travel solo through the Tusquana station. I've no time for evil or friendly ghosts. Just saying. Coming in at 2, Posada del Sol, Mexico City. In the center of Mexico City lies the ruins of the hotel Posada del Sol, an abandoned hotel that is perhaps one of the most haunted sites in all of Mexico. Now, this once upon a time magnificent structure was the project of Fernando Saldana Galvin. However, during the same time, Fernando ended his life in the hotel's courtyard after being buried in debt. Now, the Posada del Sol lies abandoned and coated in lifeless graffiti and tales of the supernatural. However, what adds to the eeriness of the hotel is the tale about the spirit of a dead young girl, who is believed to be wandering the underground chambers of the hotel. According to reports, the girl was found dead inside the hotel, which surprised authorities considering no common man can enter or even tour the hotel. However, those who have found a way often offer sweets and candy at the altar located in the macabre basement out of respect and love for the young girl. To add more mystery to the hotel, it is rumored it was actually built to perform human sacrifice as part of a satanic ritual. However, this story has never been confirmed. As of today, the hotel rests as a decrepit shell of a shattered dream, crumbling behind a tall fence and heavy security. Would you ever attempt to enter the haunted Posada del Sol? I wouldn't. And finally, coming in at number one, the Island of Dolls, Mexico City. Located in the channels of Xochimilco, south of Mexico City, is where you can find this terrifying and haunted island, aptly named the Island of the Dolls, which houses broken and deteriorated dolls of various styles and colors that were originally placed there by former owner of the island, Julian Santana Barrera. Dolls hang from the branches of trees with many missing heads or limbs. The former owner, Julian, lived in the area for more than 50 years and began his collection to fend off evil spirits after he found the body of a drowned young girl in the lake, which in turn resulted in him hearing whispers in the night which he believed were coming from the girl. So to appease the spirit, he began to hang the dolls, placing them all around the island. Sadly, however, in 2001, Julian met the same fate as the young girl, even drowning in the same place. Following his death, the island quickly became a major tourist attraction, with some visitors even claiming to see the dolls move or even talk. However, for those seeking a thrill, the island of dolls is a little tricky to access, with the only way of getting to it being via Trajanera. However, 
Most rowers will happily transport people across the island, with the journey taking approximately one hour. However, those who refuse usually do so because of superstitions. In at number five, we have the Franklin Castle in Ohio. The high Victorian home has been a fixture of the city's west side for over a hundred years. It was built in the 1880s by grocer turned banker Hans Tiedemann. Although his wealth was significant, Tiedemann's life was filled with tragedy. A distressing number of his immediate family members would die in this house. The story goes that the construction of the castle's elaborate turrets, prominent gargoyles and increasingly large network of rooms were an attempt to distract his wife from the ceaseless amount of death. That is, until she too suddenly passed away. After Deedman sold the property, it spent several decades as a German cultural centre. The tales of hauntings picked up in the 1960s, as reports of surging electricity, the sound of babies crying and a mysterious woman in black gained steam. Human bones were found in a closet in 1975. It was never confirmed who the remains belonged to, but with the number of deaths within the home, it is believed to be one of the Tiedemann's family. As the years have gone by, tales of Franklin Castle have grown. And now now include an axe murder, a mass shooting of Nazis in the basement, and the alleged hanging death of Tiedemann's illegitimate daughter. Many stories focus on heinous acts that supposedly took place in tunnels below the house. After a fire, the home laid abandoned for several years before the current owners purchased the place in 2011. In at number four, we have the Sally House in Kansas. If you're into ghost hunting shows, you probably already know this famous haunted house. The unassuming home in Kansas is rumored to be the dark lair for a demon who takes on the form of a little girl because of a family. Bizarre experiences there. Built in the mid 1800s in the growing community of Atchison, Second Street has seen its fair share of owners through the years, including the family of a six year old girl named Sally, who died in the home during a botched appendicitis surgery. It wasn't until the mid 1990s when Sally's story first gained both local and national attention, when then owners Tony and Deborah Pinkman lived in the home and began noticing strange occurrences, including attacks on Tony, unexplained voices, and apparent burnt finger marks upon mysteriously burning candles. Sally isn't some harmless ghost. Theories around her malevolent presence in the house, as well as some evidence of satanic rituals in the basement, suggest that Sally is in fact a demon disguised as a young girl. It is believed that the family was desperate in their grief and decided to perform the ritual in an attempt to bring back their daughter. Instead, they invited a demon into the home and offered them her body as a vessel. Since then, the demon has terrorized the home. Paranormal investigators have confirmed the house is haunted, but none have so far been able to cast out the demon. The Sally house is open to the public if this sounds like the holiday location for you. Coming in at number 3 we have Villa de Vici in Italy. The Villa de Vici in Italy was built around 1854. It has the nickname the House of Witches. The house was riddled with tragedies from day one. Count Felix de Vici was head of the Italian National Guard. He was considered a decorated hero. He wanted to build a dream home for him and his family. He recruited architect Alessandro Sedoli. It took around 3 years to build the home. Alessandro died a year before the villa was completed. This would come to be seen as the first bad omen. Of course, at the time, it was simply an unfortunate event. Once finished, the home was a great mansion. It was outfitted with all the modern conveniences of the time, including indoor heating. No expense was spared. The home had extensive gardens and promenades. Unfortunately, the family would not be able to enjoy their lives in the idyllic home. Sometime in 1862, the Count returned home from a day's work. He found his wife had been brutally attacked. It was too late to save her. More than that, his daughter had been taken. He had started a lengthy search for his daughter, using his best men to search as far as they were able. The daughter was never found. Later that same year, the staff found the Count in his study. He had taken his own life from the guilt of losing his family. The villa was passed from owner to owner for a few years. By the year 1960, the home would be left permanently uninhabited. The house fell into ruin. The walls have fallen and vandals have destroyed much of the interior. There are now rumours that occultists use the home for rituals. The home is said to be strongly connected to spirits and ghosts. Many entities have been spotted here. If you were to visit the home, you'd be able to sense those who passed, along with the other spirits who have been called on by rituals. Coming in at number two, we have Los Feliz Mansion in Los Angeles. Very little is known about the Los Feliz Mansion before it was bought by cardiologist Harold Perelson for his family. The family seemed to live there happily until 1959. Harold lived in the home with his wife and three children, the oldest named Judy. It was reported that Perelson was in a financial crisis. He had sunk thousands 
thousands into a medical device he had invented only to have it stolen by a colleague. Things went from bad to tragic for the family on December 6, 1959. It's reported that Harold lost his mind. He woke at around 4.30am. He took a hammer to his wife. He then went to his daughter's room. He tried to do the same thing to Judy, but failed. She managed to escape screaming. She ran to the neighbours where she could call the police. The two younger children woke up during the screaming. Harold told them to go back to sleep and that they were having a nightmare. Harold then went back to his study. He took two doses of something and 31 pills before lying down. He had passed by the time the police and ambulance arrived on the scene. The house has sat untouched since this happened. The house was purchased by a family, but they chose to leave everything in the house as they found it. They never spent a single night in the home, but came and went with storage. It is rumoured that if you go to visit the house, you can still see the Christmas tree in the living room, surrounded by the presents neatly wrapped, as well as a life magazine on the coffee table along with other signs of the time. And finally in at number one we have Louis Family Mansion in Taiwan. The Louis Family Mansion or more commonly known as Minx on Ghost House is one of the most haunted locations in Taiwan. The house built in 1929 is situated in the countryside near Chai'e. The home was once a beautiful three story perfect for any family. Looking at the home today you can see the old charm but the house is overgrown and a tapestry of trees that have claimed it over time. Louis Rong Yu, an affluent merchant and landowner bought the house for his family. It was rumoured that he had started an affair with the maid. This affair went on for years without anyone knowing anything of it. Finally, the maid got tired of being a secret and confronted his wife. Louis Rong Yu broke off the affair, choosing his family. The maid was reportedly distraught about what had happened. She jumped from the second story balcony into the well below. Some say another family member might have pushed her to save them the public embarrassment. After this, the ghost of the maid haunted the family every night, terrorizing them. She would not let them rest. It was not long before the family felt they had to move out leaving their home behind. They never sold the property, it was simply left to rot. Perhaps they did not want anyone else to be terrorised by the angry spirit they had created. Dark tourists continue to visit the house. There have been various sightings of the ghost since then. People are warned not to spend the night as this is when she looks for vengeance. Would you risk it? I certainly wouldn't.